right, so thank you all for um, for coming. Um, it's our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Oded Galor uh, presenting his new book, The Journey of Humanity, The Origins of Wealth and Inequality. Um, the book has garnered a lot of attention and, uh, and many, what we'd say in Latin America, elogios. I'll just read two because they struck me as uh, particular. The New Statesman said, a wildly ambitious attempt to do for economics what Newton, Darwin, or Einstein did for their fields, develop a theory that explains almost everything. Uh, so that puts Professor Galore in very good company. Uh, and then Nuria Rubini, who's one of our tribe, economists said, astounding in scope and insight, provides the keys to the betterment of our species, uh, which strikes me as in what we're trying to approximate at the bank, uh, but maybe on a smaller scale. In general, it's, a, it's an excellent read. Um, it takes on a lot of really big themes, which are of importance to us. Uh, it begins with unified growth theory, which Professor Galore pioneered. Uh, it discusses a lot of the institutional economics literature and how relevant that is. Um, it takes on the World Bank a bit and the Washington Consensus. Uh, so all in all, it's a very rich read um, that, uh, that I recommend to anybody interested in these topics to spend some time with. Just uh, so you know who he is, for those of you who don't know, he's the Herbert H. Goldberger Professor of Economics at Brown. Um, as I mentioned, he's the founder of Unified Growth Theory, member, fellow of the Econometric Society, co-director of the NBER Research Group on Income Distribution and Macroeconomics, research fellow at CEPR, GLO, ICA, NBER. Um, he's uh, the editor, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Economic Growth and editor of the Journal of Population Economics and co-editor of Macroeconomic Dynamics. Uh, so uh, he has a, a lot of experience in these topics. And uh, the book is a, is a fantastic synthesis of much of the things he's been working on for years. I wanted to get uh, two discussants who could, because this is a Latin American seminar, who might uh, be able to anchor it a little bit in the Latin American uh, reality. Uh, Felipe Valencia is assistant professor at the Vancouver School of Economics uh, at the University of British Columbia. He has done a lot of work on the historical forces that uh, impel Latin American development. Um, he was actually the first one to recommend Oded's book to me. Uh, he's a very well-regarded paper in the QJE on the role of Jesuit settlements in today's educational attainment in Paraguay, and an even better paper on the role of engineers in growth, uh, recently in the Journal of the European Economic Association. Um, Sergio Schmuckler uh, is a little bit less of a growth guy, but he's head of the, he's the research manager for, for the mac macro and economics group, group Macroeconomics and Growth Group at the uh, INDEC, Development Economic Research Group. He's um, out of Columbia and the University of Maryland, and he's also uh, editor of many development uh, journals, including JDE uh, and the like. Um, so two extremely good commentators on an extremely good book. So Oded, um, please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So I am delighted uh, to have this opportunity to share with you the insights that uh, I generated in the context of these uh, three decades of research. So the journey of humanity explores the evolution of human societies over uh, the entire course of human existence since the emergence of Homo sapiens in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And it attempts to resolve two of the most fundamental mysteries that surrounds this journey. The mystery of growth, namely what are the roots of the dramatic transformation in living standards that occurred in the past two centuries after hundreds of thousands of years of stagnation. And the mystery of inequality, namely what is the origin of the vast inequality in living standards across the globe. Now, over most of human existence, to a large extent, human life was nasty, brutish, and short. In fact, it was remarkably similar to that of any other species on planet Earth. 
Humans were preoccupied with survival and reproduction. Living standards was very close to the subsistence level, and there were minor differences in living conditions across time and across space. In fact, only a few centuries ago, one-fourth of newborn did not reach their first birthday, and one-half of them did not reach their reproductive age. One-tenth of women perished during childbirth, and life expectancy fluctuated in a very narrow range of 25 to 40, and rarely exceeded 40. And this was a time period in which economic crisis did not lead into belt tightening, but rather into mass starvation and extinction. But then, over the past few centuries, we see this incredible metamorphosis, dramatic transformation in living standards across time and across space. Income per capita in the world as a whole is increasing by a factor of 14, life expectancy has more than doubled, and a great divergence took place in income per capita across countries and regions of the world. Now, to illustrate this major metamorphosis that occurred in the past 200 years, consider for a moment residents of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus 2,000 years ago, and take these residents and whisk them forward in a time machine to Ottoman rule Jerusalem in the 19th century, the beginning of the 19th century. Despite this 2,000 year jump, these individuals will be able to adjust instantaneously to the new environment. Past knowledge would be largely applicable. Technological improvements would be merely incremental. Occupations would require very similar skills and life expectancy would remain largely unchanged and would not require any changes in the mindset of individuals. But now, Consider these individuals from the beginning of the 19th century in Jerusalem and whisk them fo forward again, but this time only 200 years forward, from Ottoman rule Jerusalem in the 19th century to present-day Jerusalem. Despite this modest jump forward, this would be a shocking experience, a devastating experience. Past knowledge would be largely obsolete, Modern technologies would appear to this individual as witchcraft. Occupations would require incomprehensible skills and life expectancy would double and would require a future-oriented mindset. Saving decisions, education decisions, life cycle decisions. So in contrast to the conventional wisdom, Living standard has not increased gradually in the course of human history. Technological progress accelerated gradually over time, but it had negligible impact on living standards in the course of human history. And the recent rise in living standards, in fact, reflect a phase transition, namely an abrupt transformation once a tipping point has been reached. Now, if you consider the figures in front of you. The metamorphosis in income per capita is quite apparent. If you look at the evolution of income per capita in the past 2000 years, you can see that over most of human existence, living standards are very close to subsistence and they're evolving to a large extent without a major trend around the subsistence level. But then, about 200 years ago, we see this dramatic metamorphosis, a dramatic change in living standards across the globe, a 14-fold increase on average, but in some societies, this increase in living standards is 20-fold, uh, is 50-fold, and even 100-fold. In fact, if I would remove the labels from this axis and I would show this figure, to a random scientist, this random scientist would mistakenly think that this is in fact an output of a seismograph that detects 
tectonic activities and major eruptions. But this is in fact the evolution of income per capita. Income per capita is evolving in such a way that about 200 years ago, we see this major eruption that occurs in uh, the world economy. Now, this takeoff, as you can see in page 10 of the slides, is associated with a great divergence in income per capita across the globe. Some societies are taking off as early as the beginning of the 19th century and perhaps even earlier, and other societies are lagging behind. And as a result of it, an enormous divergence is taking place across the globe. Now, resolving these two mysteries, naturally, would require the identification of the forces that permitted the transition from stagnation to growth, would require the identification of the forces that led into the differential timing of the transition across the globe, and it would require a better understanding of the role of historical and prehistorical forces in governing this differential timing of the transition across the globe. And once we will have the resolution of these two mysteries, we will have a better understanding of how to design policies, how to design strategies that could mitigate inequality across the globe. So when we consider the process of development as a whole, we have to realize that much of the inequality that is present in the world economy at the moment is originated in the distant past. And consequently, if we would like to resolve this inequality, we would like to design policies that will mitigate inequality across the globe today, we have to consider the process of development in its entirety. But when we think about the process of development, one can identify three fundamental phases, the Malthusian epoch, the post-Malthusian regime, and the modern growth regime. The Malthusian epoch originates nearly 300,000 years ago with the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa, and it lasts nearly 99.9% .9 of human existence till the eve of industrialization in the context of the most advanced societies in the world. And the Malthusian epoch is characterized by fascinating dualism. On the one hand, stagnation in income per capita, but on the other hand, dynamism in the context of technology, population, and human adaptation that ultimately brings about the transition into the post-Malthusian regime and in the aftermath of the demographic transition, the transition into the modern growth regime. So let's further understand this dualism that is characterizing the Malthusian epoch, because it is precisely this dualism that is ultimately permitting the world to take off, and it is precisely the differential pace of this dualism that generates inequality across the globe. So this dualism is reflected in stagnation in living standards over most of human existence. Income per capita fluctuated near the subsistence level over most of human existence. And life expectancy fluctuated in a very narrow range of 25 to 40. But as I said, there is great dynamism over this time period. Technology is evolving, population is evolving, and we see great adaptation of the human population. Importantly, at any point in time, the pace of technological progress is nearly negligible. The pace of, technologic, of population growth is relatively small, and human adaptation is relatively modest. But nevertheless, over 300,000 year period, we see great advancement in technology. We move from stone tool technology 300,000 years ago to steam engine technology in the eve of industrialization. The size of the population of the world increases 400 fold from the eve of the agricultural revolution to the midst of the industrial revolution over a course of 12,000 year period. And great adaptation in the human population is taking place. And it is this Malthusian dynamism that is ultimately triggering the transition from stagnation to growth. 
So let me be a bit more specific. So when we think about the wheels of change, and this will be technological progress, the size of the human population, and the adaptation of the human population, these wheels of change are operating in a very precise way. Namely, first, technology has an impact on the size of the human population. And why is it so? Because in the past, when technology is advancing, it increases income per capita, but only in the short run. This increasing income per capita permits more children to survive, permit more children to be born, and ultimately population growth is offsetting, is counterbalancing this increase in, in technology. And consequently, income per capita is reverting back to the previous equilibrium position. And consequently, over this time period, technologically advanced economies or land-rich economies had higher population density, but largely similar levels of income per capita. So if you focus on the slide in page 18, we can see the relationship between land productivity and population density. Societies that had better soil quality had higher population density in the Middle Ages, in this particular case, in the year 1500. But as you can see in slide 19, in fact, the same societies, the same land productivity did not generate higher income per capita. And similarly, as you can see in the next slide, higher technological progress is resulting in greater population density in the year 1500, but a very similar level of income per capita in the same time period. Namely, societies that are more advanced technologically have higher population density, but very similar level of income per capita. So this is one link that is operating in the Malthusian epoch. The second link is the impact of technological progress on human adaptation. The Malthusian pressure affected the size of the human population, but at the same time, the composition of the human population. Traits that were complementary to the growth process generated higher income and consequently higher reproductive success. And they became more and more prevalent in the population. And it is this adaptation that raised the prevalence of traits that were complementary to the growth process, reinforce the process, and reinforce ultimately the takeoff from stagnation to growth. So this is the second link. And the third link has to do with the origins of technological progress. The size and the composition of the population foster technological progress. And why is it so? Because they affected the supply of innovations, the demand for innovations, the diffusion of labor, the division of labor, and the extent of trade. And these forces ultimately triggered faster and faster technological progress. So when we consider the wheels of change, during the Malthusian epoch, we see that the size of the human population and the composition of the human population led into greater technological progress. And greater technological progress, on the other hand, led into larger population and more adaptable population. So in the course of human history, these wheels of change are moving and reinforcing one another. We start with a certain size of the human population that foster technological progress, that supports larger people, larger population, more adaptable population, and greater technological progress. And technological progress accelerated in the course of human history and ultimately reached a critical threshold. And beyond this threshold, the changes in the technological environment were so rapid that human capital became essential in order to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. Namely, the technological environment became very stormy and in order to navigate in this stormy environment, parents started to invest in the education of their children. But naturally, budgets were very limited. And consequently, in order to invest in the education of their children, 
parents had to economize on other items in their budget. Their, co their consumption was very close to subsistence, that they had to economize on the number of children. So human capital formation triggered a fertility decline, and this caused the Malthusian equilibrium to vanish. Namely, population growth was no longer counterbalancing advancement in technology, and the gains from technological progress were freed from the counterbalancing effect of population. And consequently, we see three forces that are contributing to the advancement of society, technological progress, human capital formation, and the decline in population growth are moving the world into the sustained growth regime. So if you look at slide 25, you can see the wheels of change in operation. It is population size, it is the composition of the population, and it is technological progress. We start with a very modest population in Africa 300,000 years ago. This population fostered technological progress, technological progress foster human adaptation and greater size of the human population, and these wheels of change are gradually rotating and reinforcing one another. But the pace of technological change initially is too slow to justify investment in human capital for production reasons. And as a result of it, we do not see massive investment in education. But ultimately, the rate of technological progress is becoming faster and faster up to the point in which a critical threshold is being reached, beyond which investment in human capital is critical in order to permit individuals to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. Investment in human capital is taking place. The demographic transition, consequently, is, uh, is, uh, is in motion, and the world is gradually gravitating towards the modern growth regime. So as you can see in slide 26, this phase transition is very similar to the phase transition that occur in nature in the transition from liquid to gas. As we boil water, and as the temperature of the water are increasing, at a certain point, once a critical threshold is being reached, we see the transition from liquid to gas. But before that, the water are remaining in the same state for a prolonged period of time. The same is true in the course of human history. Societies are, are in an agricultural stage of development. Technological progress becomes faster and faster and faster, but nevertheless, societies remain in the Malthusian epoch, living standards remain constrained by, uh, by population growth. But then ultimately, the pace of technological progress is reaching a critical point beyond which investment in human capital is taking place, the demographic transition is in motion, and we see a phase transition from the agricultural stage into the modern stage. But importantly, precisely as we see in nature, not all water molecules are converting from liquid to gas at the same time. Some are, are evaporating earlier than others, and consequently there is a divergence between these molecules. The same holds in the world economy. Some societies are taking off earlier than others, and consequently, we see an enormous divergence that is associated with the transition from stagnation to growth. So to a large extent, unified growth theory resolves the mystery of growth, provides a unified theory that suggests to us how humanity evolved from Africa 300,000 years ago to the current state. Now, when we think about the march of humanity, it appears to a large extent that thus far, the march of humanity was unstoppable. We see shattering events, dreadful events, such as the Black Death, or in the context of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the Spanish flu, and most recently COVID-19, that are devastating humanity in the short run. 
but none of them is derailing humanity from its relentless march forward. We focus on the grand arc of human development, none of this dreadful event deviating humanity from its relentless march forward. But the question naturally is whether climate change will be the single event that could derail humanity from its relentless march. And here, the journey of humanity is providing a very hopeful outlook about the future of humanity. When we think about climate change, naturally, what brings about the current trend in climate change is technological acceleration that ultimately brings about industrialization, industrial pollution, and carbon emission and, and climate change. But it is precisely the same forces of, of technological progress that are ultimately permitting human capital formation in the course of the 19th century and the incredible power of innovation that at the moment is, uh, is uh, present in humanity. In addition, this acceleration in technological progress is associated with dramatic decline in fertility. So there are three elements that are occurring at the same time. The decline in population growth that is critical in mitigating the current trend of climate change and buying scientists the necessary time to develop revolutionary technologies. And at the same time, this incredible power of innovation that we saw in the context of COVID-19. If COVID-19 would have occurred 200 years ago, humanity would have been devastated probably for decades, perhaps even longer. But here, the power of innovation is allowing us to develop mRNA technologies that are, to a large extent, rescuing humanity within a relatively short period of time for something that could have been catastrophic and long-lasting. The same will be true, or potentially could be true, in the context of climate change, provided that we will not be complacent, provided that we will adopt environmentally friendly technology, provided that, that we will comply with environmental regulations and we will enforce them strictly, and provided that the current trend of population decline will continue, scientists will have perhaps two or three decades, perhaps even longer than that, to develop these revolutionary uh, technologies that can turn this climate crisis into perhaps a fading memory um, a century from now. So if you focus on slide 29, this takes us into the second part of the book. So the first part of the book is basically moving forward in time, starting, at, starting in Africa 300,000 years ago and moving into the present, asking how humanity merged in the course of human history and why at a certain point we see this metamorphosis in living standards in the world to come. The second part of the book is focusing on the roots of inequality. And here, time is being reversed. We're starting at the present, at the level of inequality as we see it across the globe today, and we try to peel gradually different layers of influence, trying to understand what are the roots of this inequality across the globe. So we start with the present inequality, as you can see in front of you, and with the understanding that much of the inequality as we see across the globe today is originated in the differential timing of the transition across the globe. Now, naturally, if you focus on slide 30, it is tempting to think about cross-country differences in human capital accumulation, physical capital accumulation, and technological progress as the underlying cause of uneven development. But in fact, the question would emerge why some societies fail to invest properly in human and physical capital formation. Why some societies fail to advance, uh, to adopt advanced technologies. And this takes us into the understanding that there are certain barriers in the process of accumulation and in the process of technological progress. Namely, 
There are historical and prehistorical forces that created barriers in these processes and ultimately barriers in the context of development. So we can consider deeper roots of development, institutional factors and cultural factors that enhance the process of development in some places in the world and delay this process in other places in the world. And we can ultimately consider the ultimate roots, geographical and societal characteristics that led into the emergence of differential growth enhancing institutional characteristics and growth enhancing cultural characteristics across the globe. So let's start for a moment with the fingerprints of institutions. Naturally, if we observe the world, it is quite apparent that differential institutions emerge in different regions of the world. Some societies adopted growth enhancing inclusive institutions, others growth retarding extractive institutions. And naturally, this differential adopted adoption is part of the inequality that we see across the globe. But it is important to note that institutions are rarely manna from heaven. This adoption is typically not a random event. So naturally, there are some critical junctures, random events in human history that are leading into the differential adoption of institutions that are not necessarily based on underlying forces. We can think, for instance, about the fact of the Black Death, the scarcity of labor that is created as a result of it, on the decline of feudalism, and ultimately the emergence of property rights in England, and perhaps industrialization. So this is a critical juncture that perhaps can explain how institutions made a tremendous impact on industrialization in England. You can think about the impact of the Glorious Revolution on the um, adoption of constitutional monarchy in England and ultimately industrialization. Or we can think about the division of the Korea along the 38th parallel and the, uh, the divergence that occurred as a result of it between the southern part of the peninsula and the northern part. So naturally, we can think about counterfactual history in which the glorious revolution would not take place. Counterfactual history in which, in fact, William of Orange would be defeated by James II in the battlefield and England would remain for a longer period of time in absolute monarchy and industrialization would have occurred elsewhere. But as I said, typically, institutions evolved gradually in the process of development and they adapted to certain underlying forces that occurred in the course of human history. For instance, the, the Neolithic Revolution, the transition to agriculture, generated an enormous increase in population density and consequently the demand for institutions that could protect properly individuals, that can coordinate actions of individuals and can foster the implementation of vital public goods. Alternatively, we can consider the role of soil suitability for large plantation in the emergence of powerful landed aristocracy that ultimately affected the implementation of extractive institutions and ultimately even slavery. We can think about the disease environment and its impact on, the, um, on population density and the delay in the adoption of centralized institutions. All these elements are very important for the development of institutions and largely speaking, institutions were, um, were following and adapting uh, changes in the environment in which uh, they were implemented. So we need to think about perhaps deeper roots than the institutions. Institutions are important, but the question is, what is in fact standing behind much of the inequality that we see across the globe and the differential emergence of institutions? And this takes us in slide 33 to the cultural factor. And naturally, we can see the emergence of differential cultural traits across the globe. 
We can see the emergence of a growth enhancing trade, such as social capital in some regions of the world. And we can see the emergence of growth retarding traits, such as family ties in other regions of the world. In fact, these cultural traits were used or invoke to explain much of the divide between the northern part of Italy and the southern part of Italy. But yet again, cultural traits are not manna from heaven. There are rare instances in which random growth enhancing cultural mutations emerge. One of them is in the context of Judaism, in which mandatory literacy emerged in the first century CE without an economic justification or economic rationale. But nevertheless, this particular trait ultimately became very powerful as human capital became very important for economic development. Or we can think about the emergence of thrift and entrepreneurship in the course of the Protestant Reformation. But perhaps we can view these elements as some sort of cultural mutations. But mostly, culture evolved gradually in the course of human history. When the return to human capital increase, we see a gradual increase in the predisposition of individuals toward child quality. When agricultural investment is more profitable, we see that there is a greater incentive for individuals to be engaged in planting and ultimately harvesting, namely in future oriented behavior. And this leads into a cultural trait that is vital for the growth process, future oriented mindset. We see that climatic volatility is leading into attitudes towards losses and ultimately entrepreneurial traits across the globe. And we can see how the suitability of land for the use of the plow is affecting the division of labor along gender line and ultimately gender biases in society. Namely, cultural traits vastly are following the development process rather than triggering the development process. So this takes us to the shadow of geography in slide 34. When we think about the shadow of geography, we can think about geographical characteristics such as soil quality, climate, the disease environment, and geographical isolation. These elements had a direct impact, a long shadow impact on the evolution of cultural characteristics and institutional characteristics, and consequently on the process of development. But in addition, we can consider the direct impact of geography, the direct impact that has to do with the disease environment, for instance, on labor productivity, human capital formation, and the impact of isolation on trade and technological progress. Although the direct impact is not necessarily the long shadow of geography, the direct impact that in fact is gradually mitigated by the diffusion of medical technology, transportation technology, and IT technologies. So our quest to peel the different layers of influence on, on inequality as we see it across the globe is taking us further back into the time in which agriculture is first emerging nearly 12,000 years ago and the legacy of the agricultural revolution. So 12,000 years ago, we see the early transition of societies from hunter-gatherer tribes to agricultural communities. This transition is associated with the emergence of a non-food producing class. It is associated with knowledge creation in the form of science, technology, and written languages. And ultimately, this knowledge creation is generating a technological head start that persists over a prolonged period of time. And according to Jared Diamond, much of the inequality that we see across the globe has to do with variation in the timing of the agricultural revolution across the globe and this differential process of technological head start. The evidence, however, is showing something that is fundamentally different. The evidence suggests that, in fact, the, the timing of the Neolithic Revolution was critical for the understanding of comparative development till about the year 1500. But once the process of globalization started to take place, 
Comparative advantage in agriculture, limited technological spillover, and ultimately offset this positive effect of technological head start, and consequently in the present day, the Neolithic Revolution has no explanatory power about the role of uh, um, about uh, inequality across the globe. So, as we move further back in time, ultimately we go all the way back to Africa from where we are all originated from. And it turns out that the migration of Homo sapiens from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago affected the distribution of population diversity across the globe in a very fundamental fashion. And consequently, it affected comparative development. So during this exodus of modern humans from Africa, departing population carried only a subset of the diversity that existed in their parental colonies. And this diversity could take the form of cultural diversity, phenotypic diversity, behavioral diversity, or linguistic diversity. In addition, the migration was a sequential process. And consequently, the further people migrated, the lower was the degree of diversity that characterized their society. If we focus on the slide in page 38, you can see this phenomena that is known as the serial founder effect. You focus on the population in, in East Africa, you can see that the population is quite diverse. As individuals are departing from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago and moving, say, into the area that is today known as the Fertile Crescent, they don't carry with them the entire diversity that existed in the African population. And this is simply based on the fact that the size of the African population is limited, the departing population is limited, and as a result of it, the departing population is not a representative sample of the African population. It's a limited distribution from a limited set. So the society that resides in the Fertile Crescent is less diverse. It resides there, continued to flourish up to the point in which the carrying capacity of the Fertile Crescent is insufficient to support a population. Some people migrate westward into uh, Europe, others eastward into Asia and ultimately into the America. Since this process is sequential, the further people migrate, the less diverse they are. And as you can see in the slide in front of you, the least diverse population in the world is present in South America, the most diverse population in the world in Africa. If you look at the next slide, slide number 39, you can see the relationship between migratory distance from Africa and the degree of diversity. The most diverse population in the world exists in Africa, followed by the Middle Eastern population, by the European population, by the Asian population, and ultimately by the uh, American population. Now, as you can see in slide 40, diversity has conflicting effects on productivity. On the one hand, it has beneficial effects on creativity and innovations. Namely, it generates cross-fertilization of ideas, complementarities in the production process that are fostering productivity. But on the other hand, it has an adverse effect on social cohesiveness. Diversity reduces trust. It reduces the level of agreement about the desirable public goods. And as a result of it, it fosters conflicts. And consequently, if there are positive and diminishing effects of diversity on innovations, and if there are positive and diminishing effects of diversity or homogeneity or social cohesiveness, it implies that one should find a hump-shaped relationship between diversity and development. So as you can see in page, in slide 42, the relationship between diversity and development is indeed a hump-shaped one. In panel A and panel B, you can see the relationship between diversity 
and productivity in the year 1500. In A, it is population density. In panel B, it's urbanization rate. And in panel C and D, you can see different measures of economic prosperity today, such as income per capita or light intensity. And the, the results are quite striking. There is an intermediate level of diversity that is conducive for development, although the level of diversity that is conducive for development is increasing in the course of human history, namely societies that are more diverse have the upper hand since diversity be requires, uh, since diversity becomes more important in a rapidly changing technological environment. Now, if you look at the next slide, and if you focus, in fact, on all ethnic groups across the globe, uh, as they mark in slide 43, then slide 44 will show you the relationship at the ethnic group level between population diversity and population density 12,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and 500 years ago. The relationship is strikingly hump shape, and you can see the relationship between diversity as was formed, as I said, 60 to 90,000 years ago, and comparative development. So if we move to page 49, 45, you can see quite clearly the way that the, um, the journey of humanity is operating. As I underlined before, the winds of change are population size, the composition of the human population and technological progress. They're operating in the course of human history and reinforce one another. But they're not operating in a vacuum. Naturally, institutional characteristics and cultural characteristics are, fate, are affecting the pace of this rotation. Those societies that are adopting inclusive institutions are moving faster than others. Those societies that are adopting cultural traits that are growth enhancing are moving faster than otherwise. In addition, there are some initial conditions that has to do with geography and human diversity and migratory distance from Africa that are affecting both institutions and cultural characteristics and through them the wheels of change and directly the wheels of change. And this system is operating in the course of human history and ultimately technological progress is reaching a critical point beyond which human capital formation is required, a demographic transition is set in motion and a transition to modern growth. But due to these initial conditions, geography, human diversity, institutions, and cultural characteristics, this process is not moving at the same pace across the globe. Some societies are taking off early, others are lagging behind, and consequently, a huge divergence is emerging across the globe. Now, if you focus on the analysis in page 46, it is quite apparent that deep-rooted factors explain much of the variation in inequality today. Namely, 86% of the variations in inequality today can be traced to deep-rooted factors. And if we map them based on their historical precedents, the dispersal of anatomically modern human from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago explained between 17 and 26 percent of the unexplained variation in, uh, in inequality across the globe today. Time since human settlement and the Neolithic Revolution, about 3 percent. It is mostly time since human settlement. Geographical factors, a huge uh, element, 27 to 38 percent. The disease environment, about 10 to 15 percent cultural factors about 20%, and political institutions in the form of executive constraints and polity four, between three and 9%. So all factors are very important for the understanding of comparative development, and much of them, as I said, were formed in the distant past, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago. So if we, move to, if we move to slide 49, 
The question that emerges is whether history is in fact a fate. And the journey of humanity suggests that in fact history is not a fate. In fact, by considering our history, we will be able to participate in the design of our future. So the idea is that, in fact, by understanding the history of each economy, we can design growth-enhancing policies that are country-specific, that are history-specific, that are geographic-specific, that will permit societies to grow faster than otherwise and will allow us to mitigate some of the inequality across the globe. Importantly, one of the most important lessons from the journey of humanity is that one policy does not fit all nations at once. Policies must be designed for the individual characteristics, for the country characteristics, for the history characteristics, and for the geography of each place. And if you move into slide 48, you will see precisely what type of policies I have in mind. So let's consider for a moment education policies. And let's consider education policies in the context of diversity. Naturally, resources are limited. We would like to educate a population, but the question is how do we design the curriculum in an optimal fashion? If we consider a diverse society, perhaps an overly diverse society, in this type of societies, we would like the education policy to foster social cohesiveness and tolerance. We would like people to be able to respect the difference, and we would like individuals to be able to respect other ethnic groups. This will lower the cost of diversity and will permit these societies to benefit from the cross-fertilization of ideas that are associated with, uh, with diversity. But if you take the other extreme, take a very homogeneous society, in a very homogeneous society, the curriculum should be designed in a strikingly different way. We would like, in fact, individuals to learn how to challenge the status quo. We would like to generate pluralism in a place where it doesn't exist. So we would like to replace uh, um, uh, the lack of diversity with, uh, with greater pluralism, greater cultural uh, fluidity in places that it's not present. Similarly, if we think about places that are suffering from the lack of, say, future-oriented mindset, we know that future-oriented mindset, time preference, is perhaps the most important element in the process of development. It governs education decisions, saving decisions, technological adoption. And according to the measures of Hofstede, they differ tremendously across the globe. And we know that much of these variations have to do with differences in the attractiveness of agriculture in these positions. Namely, in those places where nature induced people to be engaged in agricultural activities, People learned how to be future-oriented. They planted, and with some delay, they harvested. This implies that in those places where nature was not conducive for long-term oriented behavior, we have to supplement this by placing more emphasis in the curriculum on future-oriented mindset, expose children to musical instruments that are enhancing the ability of individuals to delay gratification and to be more future-oriented, or other methods that can be used in this, in this respect. Now, interestingly enough, the journey of humanity suggests to us that progressive policies hold the key for universal prosperity. Typically, when we think about progressive policies, we tend to implement them because of our moral values. But here, the argument is that gender inequality and its impact on female labor force participation, the fertility decline, tolerance and its impact on, the, uh, on social cohesions, and diversity and its impact on, uh, on innovativeness, all the key to universal prosperity. So if you go to page, uh, the last page, 49, you can see uh, um, the, I mean, the, a diffusion of this book across uh, across the globe. 
Thank you very much. Thanks very much for a fascinating presentation of it. Um, Sergio, why don't we give you a finger a break and go to Felipe and then we'll come back to you. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to discuss uh, Odette's book. Uh, obviously, a daunting and challenging task, as you saw, there's a lot to, to unpack. Uh, let me start with a, with a personal caveat, and, and is the fact that uh, Odette was my uh, undergrad professor uh, for growth theory when I was at, uh, at Brown University. So everything that I know about uh, growth, uh, the little I know, is thanks to, to Odette. So, so it was also like a, a personal journey for, for me to discuss this book. So let me start with kind of the book and then move more towards Latin America and then a bit more globally, given the, the lack uh, chief economist audience and the World Bank audience at large. So the first part is I was just thinking how hard it is to write such a book. Uh, and I was thinking that, I mean, in economic terms, we, we like trilemmas uh, and there's almost a book trilemma. Uh, you are either broad and uh, here this book is certainly very broad, 3,000, uh, 300,000 uh, years of, of human history. Uh, you go very deep, and there's some extremely technical books. I mean, Odette has written uh, already some of those as well. Um, here, this is certainly a deep book. There's decades of frontier research. Uh, but then you also need to be readable. But this is also a very uh, readable book, so it's concise. I mean, the argument, it's, it, it, the, the, the text is around 250 pages. So it's just to, 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 to put this book in this broader difficulty of a problem of how do you actually uh, do this? So, so I, I was in awe of how the journey of humanity is able to deliver on, this, on these three fronts. Uh, Odette short several covers. This is the one in Spanish, which I guess uh, it's more relevant um, to, to, to our audience. I couldn't find the one in Portuguese, but I saw that, that Odette had it. Okay, so that's just how amazing the book is in delivering these three fronts. Let me go a bit more in depth about the topics. I mean, of course, Odette um, already covered all of it, but uh, just kind of like my reading of the book and, and why I think it's, it's so special. Um, so this is really, and I think it's not only the book, but Odette in general, uh, that's work is, is an invitation to go deeper into our understandings of comparative uh, economic development. Uh, so you can just say, okay, how, why, why are countries rich? Why are countries poor? Obviously, the, the main question in economics since Adam Smith. Um, and you can have kind of different layers, like, sus, like strata of answers. You can say, oh, it's because of capital and labor. So how do you combine this in a production function, investment? population, et cetera. So it's a bit uh, what, what many economists, including Odette, call like the proximate factors of, of growth. You can go a bit deeper and say, well, it's not only the factors themselves, but it's a combination of factors. So think about a production function. Uh, obviously, we're, I have Solo in mind here, a Nobel Prize a winning economist. Uh, it's how you combine these factors. But then the more modern research in economics and economic growth, uh, both in theory, but especially empirically, tries to go deeper and say, well, yeah, those are the proximate causes, but maybe some of the deeper things are things like human capital. So then we're also in theory in the territory of endogenous growth theory, where Odette has made many contributions, uh, the worlds of increasing returns to scale, et cetera, et cetera. You can go even deeper and say, well, that's all fine and good, but it could be institutions. So are institutions extractive or inclusive? What's the role of colonialism? Uh, Douglas North, AJR, et cetera, et cetera. And as Odette pointed out, you can even go deeper and say, well, it's culture. So it's trust, it's long-term orientation, loss aversion, that Odette has a very nice paper on that as well. Um, Max Weber, Putnam, et cetera. But then you can even go deeper, and I think that's what this, where this book really shines, and say, well, it could actually be geography. Like all of these things are, could be in a way endogenous to things like natural endowments, so very much uh, Engerman and Sokolov, the work of Jared Diamond, of Jeffrey Sachs. And I think this twist is very nicely seen in, in the work about like the Neolithic Revolution. 
So this agricultural revolution, early prosperity, but not only kind of like the, the returns on the why, but also mitigating risk. So this is kind of like a fundamental thing. And then even deeper, this is kind of the deepest 300,000 uh, years ago, uh, you can think about human and population diversity. And that's what Odette nicely showed, these graphs of the hump-shaped effect. So more diversity is good for innovation. Maybe too much diversity is bad for cooperation and conflict. Uh, and this very nice uh, IV in their AER uh, paper, which is a bit more technical, of course, uh, but that you get the intuition of this serial founder effect. So that for me is the book. And I think what's nice is to be able to have a unifying thread. So yes, maybe some of you know some of these papers, fine, you've read some of these, but even if you read these papers, like just seeing the whole argument for me was, was very uh, eye-opening and, and very rewarding. And let me now move to Latin America. And here I just put a bunch of topics uh, in this slide and in the next about where I think that it would be interesting to, to maybe have a conversation with Odette if, if, if Odette wants to pick at least one of these topics, uh, which I think are crucial for the region. So how can we think about income inequality? So of course the difference between countries, uh, but the staggering differences within countries and a lot of these human diversity is actually within countries. So maybe it's interesting to think about it that way. A uh, conflict, I mean, Latin America, obviously it's, it's, it's a region that has suffered a lot from violence, but in recent times, it's more about crime than interstate war. So can we, how can we think about that uh, in this framework? Uh, population is key. I mean, oh, that starts with the famous Hobbes quote, um, but clearly like being able to conquer that Malthusian trap, uh, so to speak, is what eventually makes countries rich. So how can we think about family planning, uh, a history of forced ster sterilizations, a horrible one, a uh, migration, and now I think the latest and aging uh, continent, even in Latin America. Uh, and I think that, I mean, you, you probably saw the map uh, of how Latin America fares in population diversity, not good at all. So how can we think about population di diversity in the least diverse region in the world? So very far away, the migratory distance from, from East Africa, but then we have some migration waves, some countries more than others. So just to, to, to start examples, Argentina versus Bolivia, I think in you know, that's data set, Bolivia is the least diverse in the world. So how can we think about that in, in our region? Um, and something that, that Bill referred to at the beginning, uh, this, this quote unquote, the criticism or attack of the Washington consensus, there, there's no one size fits all recommendations. I mean, I have a paper on this with, with Augusto de la Torre, um, but it's more about how do you cater these policies to individual countries that are unique, not only their macro uh, and monetary uh, frameworks, but also their histories, culture, natural, and especially human composition. So that's kind of like for the region, let me just, end with something which I think it's also the, the way that Odette ended, which, which was a very nice message of hope, I think, which is, well, what about beyond Latin America? I mean, it's the World Bank, it's a global audience, so how can we think about the, the world today with this framework? So I called it policy making in a deep-rooted world. How can we think about things like COVID? So in, in COVID, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of topics that come together globalization, immunity that Odette talked about, but also population diversity and ultimately technology. Like we have the vaccines to be able to overcome this, at least this time around. Maybe we can talk about inequality, distribution, etc. How can we think about the Russian-Ukraine conflict? I mean, this is uh, one of these big things of like, oh, Huntington got it wrong. Uh, this is not about uh, ethnic divisions. Like this is more about political conflict. How can we think about uh, these topics in this framework? How can we think about more domestically? I mean, most of the of people connecting, I guess, are in the in the U.S. A polarization and political polarization in the American society. So race, abortion, migration, guns, healthcare. I think that there are lessons also uh, in this book about that. And ultimately, uh, I think the biggest challenge of all um, to economic growth as a whole, which is climate change. Is this going to be the ultimate challenge to economic growth? Uh, how can we think about the role of technology on the one hand, uh, but also cooperation? And I think uh, the, the book uh, offers at the end of the day, a narrative of hope and optimism and uh, that we can overcome a lot of these horrible pressing challenges 
Um, but obviously, like it's it's important to understand where they're coming from and what are like again the deep uh, roots of of, of long term economic growth. So I'll leave it at that and and let Sergio continue the the discussion. Thanks again for for inviting me to this forum. Thanks, Felipe. Don Sergio. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, Daniel, and the LAC office for inviting me to, to comment on this book. Uh, thank you very much, Odette, for, for the presentation. It's a pleasure to, to be your discussant. This is a fascinating book by the leading economist and intellectual, a person that has done, as Bill mentioned, a lot of work on growth. And it's hard not to compare this book with other well-known bestsellers that some people might have in mind. Like Jerry Diamonds, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, Sapiens, a recent book. And also, if we go a little bit more back in history, Bill Easter's this book on, on growth uh, for people here at the bank. So I hear the Journal of, of Humanity offers a different perspective. It talks about the main factors that have produced a large rise in both wealth and inequality. And I would say that I highly recommend this book. I would put this book as one of the, the central books to read about when wants to understand humanity as a whole, uh, both going back in history and more recently. And this is extremely useful for people working on growth and development and leaves many questions open for debate. Um, the book is divided into parts. I won't go into this. I will focus on, on my main comments and I have organized my main comments in three parts. I have not um, coordinated with Felipe, but my comments are uh, similar and complementary to what Felipe has mentioned. So I, have, I want to um, mention things about the past and the future, some elements that are partly missing in the book, or at least not emphasized that I would like to kind of see more. And, and finally, um, a couple of thoughts on policy prescriptions. So regarding the, the past, I think the book does a very beautiful job at thinking about a long history with I mean, you could tell that they, Ode has a mathematical uh, mindset. Uh, he talks about the main driving factors, endogenous forces, randomness that happens in the development process. But in the end, even with nonlinearities, you see that these forces dominate in the long run. And this is, to me, is a very interesting explanation and account and framework about the history of humanity. And it's a plausible ex post analysis. Of course, it's uh, hard to test. Uh, uh, it has done many uh, papers uh, trying to test these things, uh, but I mean, it's a, it's, I think it's a very good um, account of, of what has happened. I think it's a little bit more difficult to forecast uh, the future. Odette goes into this, and as Felipe was mentioning, he has some uh, optimistic projections about the future uh, based on, on the history. Uh, so there are three areas. He mentioned about the um, uh, human capital formation and how this might trigger further growth in the future. But uh, as Felipe mentioned, uh, this uh, has an effect on fertility rates. Um, so one would need um, that the reduction in fertility and perhaps of the productive years that people have, people now when, when, when going to the labor force, they study for many years, they do postdocs, postdocs, uh, PhDs that take longer. Um, so this uh, reduction in the uh, both fertility and maybe productive years, despite the, the, the increase in the um, age for many people, uh, has to be counteracted with innovations in productivity that are so large to overcome these forces. This is an empirical question. We don't know the answer to this, but I think there is here attention that um, uh, history might, might resolve. Um, there is another issue that Felipe mentioned is um, um, cat catastrophes like uh, wars, could be nuclear events or biochemical events that might happen in the future, that uh, these the forces that we have towards development have also created tools for enormous destructions that we are witnessing right now uh, in the case of, of the war in, in Ukraine. So, um, so there might be some catastrophic events down the road. And there is this issue of climate change that I mentioned. That he's optimistic that humans will be able to resolve this over time. But in the process that we are kind of uh, becoming richer, consuming more, traveling more, um, 
even with uh, smaller populations, we are producing a lot of carbon. And this might produce um, irreversible changes in, in, in the world. Uh, some um, uh, might destroy biodiversity, population, some islands might be wiped out of the world, some cultures, some territories. So even though, despite this overall um, optimistic scenario, we might see some bumps along the road, and we might see for some people, uh, for some populations, that the devastation is enormous. So it's this optimistic scenario with this uh, potential for dangers, at least for some. Um, the elements that I think are partly missing in the book, I mentioned very briefly, is that um, the book is super uh, deep, uh, has a, a big bre um, breadth, and it's very, very um, nuanced analysis there. But the, relative to other books, it misses some of the punchline. For me, kind of this takeoff, this kettle uh, image that Ode mentioned, the wheels of change, those are things that I will, they will stick in my mind for a long time. But usually when I think about other books, I tend to think about some words that are, remind me of the book, like incentive, 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 in the case of Billy Sturz's book. In this book, I don't have that word, which is kind of some um, editorial decision on, on the part to cover a lot of things and to be comprehensive uh, without a kind of a punchline. Odette also mentioned a lot of the, vari the variance in, in the income per capita in the last 200 years, but it, it might be worth um, um, mentioning that relative to the past, that the world, we were all living at a subsistence level, uh, we are still living at a much higher level of GDP per capita than before. So once you start dispersing these kind of subsistence levels and you start generating growth in different places, kind of this variance is kind of expected at a much higher level. And the level is probably maybe not emphasized enough um, in the book. There is this issue of, of cross-country versus within-country differences that Felipe mentioned. I think within-country uh, um, differences in equality is something that is of interest to many people. And it's difficult to explain by some of the same factors that are explaining the cross-country differences because of that mentioned issues of geography, culture, institutions, etc. Those apply within countries. And we still see a large uh, dispersion in, in, in income within countries that might be explained by skill bias technological changes, but that suggests that we have different factors affecting within country differences and cross country differences as well. A um, couple of other things is that um, in the, uh, the, the book talks about the deep uh, rooted um, causes of development, but at the same time we, have, we are seeing a, um, a dynamic uh, world and this dynamic world we see countries uh, collapsing uh, in GDP per capita, like Argentina, relative to uh, the, the 100 years ago. But we see other countries taking off very rapidly. China, Israel, Singapore, if you visit these countries, you see enormous transformations even in 40 years. So these deep-rooted factors were there before, but countries are catching up. So the question is to what extent these uh, dispersions in income per capita um, will persist over time or not. The other thing is that it, the book has, to some extent, it has migration, but it's a close type of economy analysis. You have initial conditions that determine the fate of different countries, but right now we are seeing more transfers in technology, knowledge sharing, uh, institutions that might be transferred across border, migration, and diversity through international cooperation. If you look at the COVID-19 crisis, uh, I was a, um, the, DNA was shared across the world. There were teams across the world um, uh, developing these vaccines. It's not in one place. It was a, a team, a work team effort that developed these, these technologies. So you have kind of that through this cooperation, you have you can achieve diversity, even though uh, you have um, people like, for example, in Argentina doing the, the the trials of the vaccine, coordinated with people in the U.S. So you you can achieve diversity and knowledge uh, transfer through this international cooperation that we see very much play out uh, during the recent crisis. The other thing that I see missing in the book, that, or at least not emphasized, is this issue of a savings technology. Or they mentioned about the Neolithic Revolution and, and why they have been stuck with uh, increasing the uh, population size, 
but not increasing GDP per capita. And maybe there was uh, a lack of saving um, technology for retirement that pushed people to have more kids to save for retirement, but not accumulate wealth for the long term. That leads to the, the last part, which is the policy prescriptions of what to do. So that mentions um, the Washington consensus that is not good uh, to use those type of policies, but I think um, my understanding is that the IFIs have moved away a bit from the Washington consensus. They are already trying to uh, um, design specific uh, recommendations for different countries by doing a country diagnosis. So we are not in the Washington consensus world anymore. That, that was there 20, 30 years ago, but not, not now. Um, and one, one policy is education. I, I'm not an education specialist, but I think it's, it's extremely interesting, but it's difficult to design good uh, policies for education, especially for countries that don't have a lot of resources. Well, they mentioned the importance of well-rounded education, but that's costly for many countries to achieve. Um, and, and, and maybe more specialized education with more tools, it might be a more intermediate goal that countries might um, be able to achieve in the shorter term. Another debate in education is who to educate. Do we educate more the young children versus the people going to universities, given the limited resources? Lastly, let me mention that when we start thinking about particular policy recommendations, doing policy making is very hard, even for intelligent people that join uh, policy makers. We have many examples of those in Latin America. It's extremely difficult to put in practice uh, sometimes good policies. It's impossible to start to pick uh, winners ex ante in the presence of large uncertainty. We don't know what different countries should be doing. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult to break uh, vicious uh, uh, cycles that hamper growth uh, with, for example, uh, the case of corruption. It's in difficult to um, uh, have a, a, an open discussion about the priorities and explaining the trade-off of the different policies and who will be hurt in the, in the short term and who will gain in the long term. And it's very difficult sometimes uh, to um, set people to focus on long-term returns, either the short-term political cycles and incentives to people have and, and needs that people have in the short term. So even though we have these ideas in mind, uh, and, and I agree with um, uh, Odette to design specific policies, uh, in the practice is sometimes extremely challenging. So thank you very much. It's a fascinating book. I, I highly recommend it. Thanks, Sergio. Um, oh, did we have about four minutes? I don't know if you wanted to respond to either of the sets of comments. Um, um, yeah, I can try. I naturally the, the the comments are very broad, and uh, for, well, first I'm grateful. At the, uh, thanks for the compliment. I do. Uh, I do think that it's important that the ideas in this book will be diffused broadly. I think that they have the seeds for. Uh, a resolution of a significant portion of the inequality that we see across the globe. And the more popular they will be, the more likely these policies will be adopted. At the same time, I'm naturally sympathetic to many of the points that were raised, but I think that uh, to a large extent, particularly if we think about so, as I said, if I think about the argument, I mean, so the argument suggests to us that history is very important. History is very important for the understanding of the roots of inequality and the present inequality. And it is very important in the design of policies that could mitigate inequality. Now, so some of you suggested that, in fact, it is a bit complex because uh, naturally the policymakers have perhaps limited horizon. They're uh, concerned by their political cycle as opposed uh, to the, the long-term uh, horizon that are needed for that, some of these policies. But in fact, what I'm trying to argue is that at the moment, enormous amount of resources are poured to education. I'm not suggesting to increase the resources. I'm simply suggesting to reallocate them more wisely in the sense that there is no need to reinforce long-term orientation in places where nature reinforced long-term orientation. But there is a need to do so in other places. So take the budget, take the political cycle as given, simply prioritize 
different elements in the education curriculum in such a way so as to foster what is missing. We refer to Bolivia as the most homogeneous country in the sample, then try to use part of the education budget rather, to worry, rather than worrying about years of education, worry about the quality of education, foster diversity where it's missing. And as I said, teach children how to challenge the status quo. Teach children how to respect less authority because the issue there is not social cohesiveness, it's the less lack of diversity. Very different than what I would urge policymakers to do in Ethiopia that is very diverse. There, I would like people not to challenge the status quo because they do so too often. I would like them, in fact, to foster uh, a tolerance. So again, I'm not suggesting finding additional budget to target these elements. I'm just suggesting reallocating budget in a wiser way. Now, in the context of climate change, again, I'm very sympathetic to the view that, that cooperation is very important. The world is heterogeneous. There is an issue about compliance and there is an issue about free riders. But again, partly based on my own research, I know that the propensity of carbon emission with respect to the scale of the population versus the propensity for carbon emission with respect to the richness of the population is fundamentally different. Namely, if you have two societies that have the same level of income per capita, sorry, the same level of total income, but in one of them, income is generated by the scale of the population, and the other one, income is generated predominantly by the prosperity of the population, carbon emission, according to my estimate, will be sevenfold larger in places where population is larger. And as a result of it, fertility control, again, can generate a win-win situation. It can, prosper, can foster economic growth, and at the same time, can generate reduction in carbon emission, as I said, as a way to mitigate the current trend of climate change and permit human ingenuity to re resolve some of the problems that are associated uh, with climate change. Naturally, some of the processes may be irreversible at the moment, but those processes that are reversible can be mitigated by the human ingenuity. And we saw human ingenuity in the course of human history. In mean, any time that society and humanity was on the verge of extinction and collapse, think about it in the eve of the agricultural revolution, population Population exploded up to a point in which there were no additional agricultural niches to be conquered. And then human ingenuity taught us how to domesticate plants, how to domesticate, domesticate animals, and ultimately permitted the humanity to flourish, prevented, uh, prevented extinction, in fact, permitted a huge explosion of the human population. And this occurred repeatedly. So, based on the observations on human history, I can say with great confidence that human ingenuity is always marshaled at the point in which humanity needs it most. And I don't think, again, this is a, a, a statistical statement, that, that this would be very different in three or four decades from now, where the catastrophe associated with climate change will loom up to a point where it will need to be resolved. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, and with that, I think we have exhausted our time. Um, Odette, I want to thank you very much for an incredibly stimulating book. I recommend it to anybody interested in these in thinking through these issues, but on a on a on a grand scale. Um, and thanks to Felipe and to uh, Sergio for uh, for careful reads and for insightful comments. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, talk to you soon. Thanks, Odette. Thank you very much. Thank you.